format of the debate will be as follows. Uh, there will be an opening statement first from the proponent, Vice President Dobrovskis, and then from the opponent, Mr. Kaczynski. After the opening statement, there will be a few questions from me, to which both participants will respond, and then we'll open to questions from you on this topic of the Euro, allowing both participants the chance to respond. I now look to Vice President Dobrovskis to make his opening remarks in favour of this proposition that the Euro is now stronger than ever before. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for this uh, invitation and for this uh, possibility to debate on the important topic of Euro. This House would say yes to Europe. That was a notion uh, before this uh, chamber 43 years ago in 1975 and it is still considered one of the most famous uh, debates hold, uh, in, uh, held in this beautiful debating uh, chamber. Uh, it was uh, live on BBC One and uh, the nation watched as this uh, 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 house voted overwhelmingly for uh, uh, yes to Europe with 493 eyes to 92 no's. And it must be said, it must have been uh, crowded here with almost 600 people in attendance in this uh, venue. And only two days uh, later, the UK voted by two-thirds uh, two majority to remain within the European Union, or as it was called then, the European Communities. Today, I'm here on behalf of European Commission to defend the motion that the Euro is stronger than ever. I will argue there is heavy evidence to support this case, but I want to be even more ambitious. So today, I also want you to convince that a Euro is, in fact, a success story for Europe. I will focus on three uh, points. First, that Europeans are better off with Euro as their currency. Second, that it is true also in times of crisis. And finally, I will demonstrate that Euro now is stronger than ever before. So uh, now let me uh, uh, rewind a bit and take you back to 2009. This was at, uh, at the, uh, the time when my own country, Latvia, was going through major uh, crisis. It has been hit by global financial uh, crisis and there were domestic factors why it was affected particularly hard. And that was a year when I became uh, Prime Minister of Latvia and at that time some media were calling it the worst uh, job in Europe. So we had to work hard to fix our economy and to bring our budget deficit under control. But during that whole time, the goal of joining the Euro was also helping to concentrate our minds. And within five years, as of January 1st, 2014, Latvia joined the Euro. The reasons we wanted to join the Euro area were similar uh, for uh, also other members of the currency union. Uh, they are all about benefits for people, businesses and countries by replacing 19 different currencies by one. Uh, for example, the euro has removed the cost of converting currencies, which makes it easier to do business across borders. Uh, it has helped to reach lower interest rates and more stable prices. In addition, Euro plays an important role as an international currency. It's a second reserve currency after US dollars with 60 countries uh, pe uh, pegging or uh, uh, attaching their uh, currency in one way or another to the Euro, including also EU member states like Bulgaria and Denmark. And finally, the Euro has made uh, traveling ac across Europe much more easy. With all these benefits, it's no coincidence that so many European countries have adopted the Euro and that several others are interested in doing so. Uh, and it's not surprising that most Europeans support the Euro. 
A recent EU-wide poll found that more than 70% of Europeans consider the euro to be a good thing for European Union. And this is actually higher than before the crisis. Uh, this brings me to the second topic, that euro helped us through the crisis. European countries, small and big, are better with the euro, even in times of crisis, and I would argue especially in times of crisis. Uh, of course, not uh, everyone agrees to this. Uh, some people claim that individual <laughs> member states uh, would have been uh, better off without the euro, that uh, being outside the currency union would uh, uh, allow them to devaluate their currency to make exports uh, uh, cheaper uh, or to print money to inflate away uh, the debt. Uh, but uh, people who support this theory uh, tend to forget three important uh, things. Uh, first, that the countries uh, hit by the debt crisis usually have the loans priced in other currencies, like euros or US dollars. So devaluation would only make uh, servicing those loans more expensive. Uh, second, printing money is extremely short-term solution. It does not solve the underlying problems in our economy, like the lack of productivity in private sector or government living behind its means. Uh, but the main problem with devaluation is that it also increases inflation. Uh, most uh, people possibly uh, associate high inflation with uh, countries like Venezuela or Zimbabwe. But even here in Europe, in the 1980s, uh, several countries saw inflation uh, rates uh, around 15%, 20%, even exceeding 20%. Uh, uh, it's because not only devaluation uh, reduces the price of exports, it also increases the price of imports. And in a single market with cross-border supply chains, this simply leads to inflation. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, because we had the euro that we avoided the pitfall of competitive devaluations during the crisis. And this problem has plagued Europe for decades, since the uh, 1970s, after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. Thanks to the euro, we replaced competitive devaluation and inflation with predictable, uh, with stable prices and predictable conditions for business. And also because we had the euro that uh, countries which relied on unsustainable economic models realized the need for structural reforms. And in countries like Ireland, Spain, Portugal, the Baltic states, we had seen great results of such reforms. For example, Ireland has grown by over 4% for the last four consecutive years, so other countries should follow their footsteps. And finally, it was because we had Euro that we sat down to find a common solutions to our common problems which we are facing. So uh, this is why that despite still painful legacy of the crisis, European economy has emerged stronger than before. Uh, we are now in a six year of co six consecutive year of the economic growth, and more people have job in Europe than ever before. But uh, I'm not here only to talk about European economy. I'm here to prove that Euro itself is stronger than ever. Uh, I admit that the euro was born in less than ideal conditions. And like many things uh, in Europe, we had to go, uh, achieve big goals in small consecutive steps. Uh, and in the beginning, we didn't have the political backing to put in place the tools to fully support the euro. Uh, for example, when the euro was uh, introduced, uh, those who wanted to join had to fulfill certain convergence criteria. 
but uh, and uh, 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 talking about this already in 1989, uh, one of the founding fathers of the euro, Jacques Delors, explained why this is so important. So I quote. Monetary union without a sufficient degree of convergence of economic policies is unlikely to be durable. It could, in fact, be damaging to the European community. And despite this warning, the economic and fiscal policy coordination that followed was relatively weak. This means that uh, certain balances built up within the euro area during the good economic times known as a great moderation. And uh, when the crisis hit, we didn't have an uh, effective means to prevent markets from turning on vulnerable countries. So it was the eurozone crisis that created the political support to finally address this, these weaknesses and to strengthen the euro. So let me go through four most important ways we have done for this. And let me warn you, this part is uh, going to be a bit uh, technical, but uh, uh, we need to go through this to prove that Euro is stronger than ever. So first, we have introduced the European semester. This means we have reinforced fiscal and macroeconomic uh, uh, policy coordination at the EU level. And by coordinating more uh, uh, closely, we can detect problems early on and stop them before they escalate. It's uh, clear uh, this needed because in currency union, problems uh, that happen in one country can quickly spill over to others. Second, we have created a European stability mechanism. Uh, and it has half a trillion of euros of firepower to support a Euro area member states if they lose access to markets. Third, we must remember that the crisis started as a financial crisis. That is why we created the banking union. It ensures EU level supervision that's, uh, for the largest banks and common framework for managing bank crisis. And it has introduced the principle of bail-in instead of bail-out. Uh, it means that it's banks, uh, shareholders and creditors, which are first in line to pay for a banking uh, system losses and not taxpayers. And in addition, European Central Bank now has powerful monetary policy tools. Uh, and here I wanted to ask a question to the audience, or even two questions. So the quest question is, how many of you have heard about outright monetary transactions? Okay, not too many, if not to say quite a few, quite few. Uh, okay, uh, and then the second question, how many uh, of you have heard of the statement of Mario uh, Draghi, uh, president of the ECB, during the Eurozone crisis, that uh, he committed to do whatever it takes to save the euro. Okay, much more, good. Uh, and actually what Mario Draghi was referring to in his statement was outright monetary transactions. So uh, those are monetary policy tools which we now have, uh, which European Central Bank now has to defend the euro. So it's because of all of these steps and more, uh, it's uh, uh, that Euro now is stronger than ever before. And I uh, must say I wish my opponent in uh, good luck in uh, attacking this uh, notion, uh, because uh, then uh, he should tell us uh, when exactly Euro was stronger than now. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in 1975, uh, when this uh, House debated whether or ne uh, no to say yes to Europe, single currency was only a distant dream. But uh, only in a few uh, months, the Euro will be celebrating its 20th anniversary. 
Uh, of course, the euro is a baby to compare with uh, pound uh, sterling, which, can, which origins can be traced 12 and a half centuries ago, or also to compare with US dollar, which is uh, well over 200 years old. But despite its young age, euro is already a successful and strong currency, and I am confident that it will grow even more successful over the next 20 years and beyond. Thank you very much, and I look forward for answering your questions. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, Vice President Dombrovskis. I now look to Mr. Kaczynski for his opening remarks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I stand before you as the first ever Polish-born British Member of Parliament. And I came to this country in 1978 as a six-year-old. And then I went back to Poland during communist times to see my family. And I think my passion for sovereignty uh, and the, the country state and sovereignty uh, really has been affected by those early childhood experiences of living in a communist country, in a country that had no sovereignty at all, where the people had no rights and everything was decided for that country in another country. I want to start off by, um, and, and, and by the way, I, I'm looking forward to explaining the unique situation that exists now between Poland and the United Kingdom in the whole Euro and EU context, as our two countries increasingly will diverge over the coming years. I'd like to start off by applauding the British people, first of all, because 20 years ago, it was the British people who decided that this country would not have the euro. It wasn't the politicians. You're too young to remember. But I remember at that time all the opinion polls and everything that the people were saying to British politicians was this. Yes, carry on with the EU project, but we are not going to allow you to ditch our currency. That is a step too far. It impinges too much on our sovereignty and it will have major ramifications for future generations in how they can or cannot make decisions, strategic decisions for the future of their country. So it was the British people who decided, and I will return to that theme over and over again in my speech, because I want you to constantly remember and think about how important it is for people, for citizens, to make these decisions rather than politicians or bureaucrats or people who are not directly accountable to you and who you cannot throw out at the ballot box. If we had ditched the pound sterling, I can probably uh, be quite confident in saying that in the referendum two years ago, we would not have voted to leave the European Union. I think a lot of people would have been too frightened. You will know that the vote was very close. It was 52 to 48 percent. And I think it would have been, uh, some people would have been too frightened. They would have voted the other way. Because they would have thought that if we pull out of the European Union and change the currency at the same time, it would have created too much economic instability and therefore they would have voted to remain in the European Union. So the currency issue is yet another shackle that the European Union is imposing on the sovereign nation state. It is trying to tie the sovereign nation state so much in its supranational structure that the sovereign nation state has no power to make decisions for itself. They want to cement all countries into this supranational state. And of course, I see Twitter, Twitter accounts, people who abuse me on Twitter uh, about my Brexit views, and they have a flag on their Twitter. And it's the European Union flag. No British flag, just the EU flag. And we see that flag increasingly around our country. This project has been paid for by the European Union. The fact that it's actually British taxpayers' money in the first place is conveniently overlooked. 
but they want you to think of one flag, the European Union flag, not your own flag. President Juncker has stated that he wants his legacy to be one president of the Commission. One president, one flag, one president. They want a single currency for all the countries of the European Union and now they are talking about their next pet project, a single European army. A single European army which at best will duplicate the services of NATO, an organization that has kept the peace on the continent of Europe for 70 years and at worst will usurp NATO, destabilize it and push away potentially those countries, those six countries that are in it, inextricably linked to the common defense of the continent of Europe, but who are not members of the EU and never will be. America, Canada, Iceland, Norway, Turkey, and as of March of next year, the United Kingdom. And we have already seen the ineptitude of the European Union in its dealings with Ukraine, where many people in our country actually blame the European Union for its miscalculations in some of the agreements in Ukraine, which many people in our country accuse of contributing to the crisis which then led on with Russia. The euro has been forced on many people against their wishes. And I want you to, I'm going to read out a quote to you from the former German Chancellor, the late Helmut Kohl. When he was interviewed in 2013, he said this, I knew that I could never have won a referendum here in Germany. We would have lost any plebiscite about the introduction of the euro. That is very clear. So Herm Hermit Kohl realized that the German people did not want to abandon the Deutsche Mark, but he, as a politician, committed to the EU project, chose to ignore bypass the people, sideline what the people wanted uh, for that obsession with creating a supranational state. The EU is then going to uh, bludgeon countries into joining the Eurozone. There are, as you know, eight countries that are members of the European Union that have not yet joined. Czech Republic, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, and Romania. And I have to say to you that many of the people in these countries are against the euro. In the Czech Republic, 70, in the latest opinion poll, and by the way, please have these facts verified for yourself, don't take my word for it, but these are all um, statistics I've got from the House of Commons Library this afternoon. In the Czech Republic, 71% of the electorate are against the introduction of the euro. In Sweden, it's 71%. And in the country of my birth, Poland, 58% of the people do not want the euro. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, they're going to have to have it. Irrespective of what the people want, they are contractually obliged to join and they have no recourse to keep their own currencies. And when they bludgeon all these countries into adapting the euro, they will telephone Copenhagen, the one country that has a permanent opt-out out, out of the eurozone, when the United Kingdom leaves, the one country left with a permanent opt-out, they will telephone Copenhagen and say, you know you thought you had a permanent opt-out from the euro, well, think again. We can't have a system with 27 countries using the same currency and you using your own currency. So they will come after Denmark because it, they have to have a single currency for this supranational state. And I will go back to the country of my birth to campaign for a referendum. If I have to raise the money myself to challenge the government and the court of law, whatever it takes, but we will have a referendum in Poland to make sure that it's the Polish people who decide whether or not they abandon their currency. Because, and it's my recurring theme, it has to be the people who decide, not politicians and not bureaucrats. I think giving up your so currency makes you lose so much of your sovereignty. My, many members of my family were killed 
tortured during the Second World War. Some of them were killed by Germans. Six million people were killed in Poland. Warsaw was completely destroyed. 95% of Warsaw was destroyed. I take delegations of British MPs to the city of my birth and take them to the Warsaw Uprising Museum for them to see how people fought for liberty and the sacrifices that they made because they believed in the nation state and they didn't want their state to be occupied or to be dictated to by others. And I think it's very, very important to remember the sacrifices of that generation. It's all about cent control from the centre. And the euro, of course, is going to be controlled by the EU Central Bank and by the EU Commission. Nobody, people who you have any influence over whatsoever. I say to my constituents in Shrewsbury, when I go to public meetings, they know who I am because being the tallest MP ever <laughs> at six foot nine, they know who I am and they come to my office in my surgery and they say, Mr. Kovczynski, I don't like the way you're doing this or I want you to do that. Or they stop me in the supermarket or they stop me in the swimming pool with my daughter. They know who I am. They know how I vote. They can throw me out. And they hold me to account every week when I go back to my constituency in Shrewsbury. But I say in public meetings, I say to, I put a hundred pounds on the table. And I say, I'll give you, any, anybody here, a hundred pounds if you can name me any of the members of the European Parliament that represent you. Haven't lost a penny to date in 14 years. Why? Because nobody knows who they are. They represent an area called the West Midlands of nearly six million people. None of them live in Shropshire. None of them have homes in Shropshire. None of them come to Shropshire. None of them have offices in Shropshire. And, by the way, they work in another country. How is that making them closer to the people that they represent? How is that making them accountable and transparent? And what rights do you, the people, have to hold them to account? Greece, I would say to my Latvian esteemed opponent, Greece, I just say that one word. What the people of Greece have, have been through, our fellow Europeans, is absolutely abhorrent. And as somebody who has visited that, that country many times, I'm always shocked to hear of the stories and the poverty that that country has been through in recent years. Of course, when a country faces economic instability or difficulties, the government can, of course, devalue its currency. It can make different macroeconomic decisions, which are specific and tailor-made to, <coughs> to that country. Very, very important. We've seen it here in the United Kingdom where well, we have had to take huge macroeconomic decisions uh, to improve the economy as a result of a crisis. But of course, Greece has nothing because all of the policies are dictated, not for the benefit of Greece, but for the benefit of Germany and the other bigger countries. And so Greece, of course, has been sacrificed on the altar for the common EU project. And lastly, and this is hopefully my killer point, I spoke to my friend and colleague Jacob Rees-Mogg, who I know uh, and I, who's, I respect hugely. He's the, he's the chairman of the European Research Group and I'm a member of that organization, holding the Prime Minister to account over the Bre Brexit negotiations and I know he's spoken to you in the past. I went up to Jacob Rees-Mogg in the voting lobby, explained to him that I would be addressing you this evening and I said, what do I say to them? And he said a very important point, which of course I already have the figures for. Again, from the House of Commons Library, please check these facts. But there are two things I want to explain to you. Have a look for yourselves at the government debt of each country. And you will find that the non-Eurozone countries have much lower government debt than Eurozone countries. Poland not in the Eurozone, has debt 50% of its GDP. Look at Greece, 178. Spain, 98. Italy, 131. Portugal, 125. Staggering amounts of debt. Because the, because the countries have to borrow massively and cannot implement their own specific macroeconomic policies in times of crises and the 
crisis, crisis that we've just been through. And lastly, unemployment. Look again at the, look at, again at the levels of unemployment. Massive <coughs> unemployment in Eurozone countries, low unemployment in non-Eurozone countries. In, UK, in the United Kingdom, we have 4% unemployment. 4% unemployment, the lowest level of unemployment since 1971. Just listen to the figures for the Eurozone. Greece, 19%. Spain, 15%. Italy, 10%. France, 9%. And most important for you, youth unemployment. Again, massively higher in the Eurozone nations than in the non-Eurozone nations. So those are the points I wanted to make to you. I believe as a politician that I'm just a transient figure. Here today, gone tomorrow. And I must not make decisions which will bind your hands in perpetuity and force you to comply with what I think is right for our country. No. We need a debate on this continent. We want not just a one-size-fits-all fits supranational state. We want a constant debate as to what is in the interests of each national sovereign nation state. And that is why we cannot move too far into this supranationalist state, including ditching your currency, because we will be binding your hands and we want you to make decisions when your time comes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. I want to begin by asking you about overexpansion and the size of the monetary union. When Sir John Major spoke uh, in this chamber just before the referendum on Brexit in 2016, he said that the European Union had made a categorical mistake in admitting too many countries outside of its original core. Do you believe, uh, first starting with you, Vice President Dabrowskis, that the euro has overexpanded and has admitted too many countries of a varied economic background? Or do you think that the euro is in a secure position with a variety of different economies present? Well, um, thank you uh, for this uh, question on, um, on euro, on euro over expansion. Probably, if allowed, I would also come back to some of the points raised uh, uh, specifically in uh, euro. So, uh, first, on um, sovereignty. I was grown up in a country which was occupied by Soviet Union and which regained uh, independence when I was in a student years. But I was also participating in those demonstrations with hundreds of thousands of other people demanding Latvia's independence. So I also have certain uh, feelings about sovereignty. And I was a prime minister who was arguing very uh, uh, intensively uh, uh, for Latvia to join the uh, Eurozone. And I think it only strengthens our sovereignty. And uh, after all, it was also Polish people which decided in a referendum by a clear majority to join the European Union. And not seeing it as an uh, impediment of its uh, sovereignty, but rather as a way to strengthen its sovereignty by belonging to strong uh, economic and political bloc and Joining the euro in this sense is actually not weakening of the country's sovereignty. Uh, but let me uh, come back to the economic uh, arguments. Uh, lots of statistics have been uh, uh, said. Uh, countries having public debt from here to there, which is a country which has the lowest uh, public debt in the EU? It's Estonia. They had the lowest pub public debt before they joined the Eurozone, they have the lowest public debt after they joined the Eurozone, and it has relatively little to do with which currency they are exactly using, Estonian crowns or Euros, if the government has made decision not to overspend, not to live behind its means, you can have low public debt with or without Euro. Euro is not to blame. Crisis. It's absolutely true that Greece has done through incredibly difficult times. As, by the way, has Latvia. Because uh, if you asked in 2008, 2009, which EU country was by far 
most severely hit by a crisis, the answer was not Greece. The answer was Latvia. And Latvia was not in Eurozone. And there were reasons why Latvia was so heavily uh, hit. We can go into this. Uh, but uh, the, by and large is the following. If you mis mismanage your economy, it ends up in tears, with or without Euro. Once again, not the Euro is blamed for, a, uh, 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 for, for a economic problems, but it's uh, macroeconomic and fiscal mismanagement. As was the case in Latvia before, in cri before the crisis, as was the case in Greece before the crisis, and uh, several other uh, uh, countries. And that's why he, we have strengthened, among, uh, among other things in Eurozone, the fiscal and macroeconomic surveillance exactly to avoid that kind of mistakes in the future. Indeed, it's a, it's a mistake that we allowed before the crisis those macroeconomic macro imbalances to develop inside the Eurozone or outside the uh, uh, Eurozone. Uh, but then the question you asked uh, concretely is Euro overexpanded? Euro currently has 19 member states and uh, several other member states are interested in joining. Bulgaria is already concretely on track in, with their work. Uh, we expect soon Croatia joining. But I would uh, uh, come uh, back to this uh, 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 one point. Uh, no one is, uh, how you were telling, forced into Eurozone. Uh, no one is putting uh, shackles. Uh, Poland, like other so-called new member states, joined in 2004. Now is 2018. Has Poland been forced into Eurozone? Are there any concrete plans to force Poland in Eurozone in coming years? Nothing, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's true that countries, as soon as they were joining the Eurozone, were committing to, uh, to uh, uh, sorry, when they were joining the EU, they were committing to join also the Euro. But there are no deadlines and there are no enforcement mechanisms and no one has been dragged into Euro against its will. Why Sweden is not in Eurozone? Because there was a referendum and majority voted against. So Sweden is not in Eurozone and nobody is forcing them in and putting shackles on their hands, as you were uh, uh, telling. Uh, coming back to Greece, support for Euro in Greece is somewhere in line with EU average, around 70%. Uh, even after all this major uh, crisis, as by the way in Latvia it's around 70%, also after our crisis and after we joined the uh, uh, Euro. So uh, the question is why? Why people uh, support Euro? Uh, it's easy of course to say, oh, we have such a great idea, devolution, that will solve all the problems. First I uh, 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 tried to uh, make some points in uh, introductory remarks, why it would not solve countries' problems, but um, uh, then you need to uh, get more concrete. Okay, what a great idea. Now we lock all the people's savings in banks. We uh, lock uh, forcefully all the assets uh, they have, stocks, bonds, whatever they may happen to have. We have to lock it in, forcefully convert to drachma maybe or whatever currency and take 40% or whatever percent away of its value. Somehow people are not terribly excited by this bargain. And if you would start talking about this, I think people would think, have an idea. Maybe I store my euros, not in Greece, maybe I store it in a neighboring country. So you have to do it in some kind of a coup d'etat way, kind of overnight, without, with pro without proper democratic procedures. So, uh, sorry, it's not, uh, uh, not so easy, but uh, the point is that with or without euro, you need to follow responsible fiscal and macroeconomic policies. So, Euro does not abolish the need for responsible macroeconomic uh, policy, but if you uh, follow responsible macroeconomic policy, you are able to enjoy benefits of the Eurozone. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, that's what people in Eurozone are appreciating. And that's indeed a bit uh, interesting phenomenon that support for Euro in Eurozone countries is actually much higher than support for Euro uh, in non-Eurozone countries. Uh, so, uh, my answer to your concrete uh, question, no, Euro is not uh, overreaching. Uh, uh, Countries can uh, function with Euro with 
different levels of economic development. Let's take uh, uh, Bulgaria. We're asking, okay, can Bulgaria join uh, Euro? But Bulgaria already for many years, uh, decade or more, has fixed exchange rate with Euro. So Bulgarian level is anyway fixed with Euro. They are not devaluating it back and forth. It provides certain stability anchor to the economy, helps also with lower interest rates and many other things. And yet there is a re residual currency exchange risks for vi which Bulgaria is systematically paying higher interest rates. So they are uh, with a fixed exchange rate anyway, uh, in importing de facto the monetary policy of the ECB without reaping any benefits of being part of Euro. Uh, and the same, technically speaking, is true about uh, Denmark. It's true they have this permanent opt-in, not out, uh, opt-out, but that's a nuance. Uh, but they also have fixed exchange rate to Euro, following the same uh, uh, policy. And especially for countries with fixed exchange rates, this choice is more obvious, economic case is more obvious uh, to join, as it was the case for Latvia and for all three uh, Baltic states and for a number of other countries. Thank you. Thank you. Your reply. Well, of course, <clears throat> of course, if you look around the world, there are countries cooperating with one another in a very effective way uh, without being in the currency union. And their populations and their politicians don't want to abandon their currencies and they are cooperating really well. Uh, look at the GCC um, in, in the Gulf. Uh, increased, there's talk about <clears throat> increased cooperation between GCC countries, but they uh, are not prepared to abandon their currencies. Look at Mercosur in Latin America, all the countries of Latin America cooperating with one, with one another without abandoning their currencies. NAFTA as well in North America, the Asia Pacific Pact, that nobody else in the world, although cooperating with one another, is seeking to abandon their, their currencies. And my life's ambition and goal is to show Poland, the country of my birth, that the two things that she feels very important, very strongly about, is defense and trade. And in the post-Brexit world, I want to show the people of Central and Eastern Europe that they can have defense and trade with the United Kingdom and America to the same extent as they can get from Germany without being in a political and currency union with us? Is it possible for us to give to our Latvian friends and Polish friends the same level of defense and trade without having the same currencies, without being in the same political union? I would argue that it is, and that's something that should be tested. Of course, um, we have 19 countries now in the Eurozone, but don't forget, I've talked to you about the other countries they want to force into the Eurozone, and then there will be Albania, then Macedonia, then Serbia, then Montenegro, then Ukraine, then Moldova. At some stage, all these countries may join the, the European Union, and then ultimately the Eurozone. How sustainable and practical is it in reality to have so many currencies from so many different countries with so many different historical contexts and backgrounds, with people with such polarizing and different objectives and priorities, how is it f possible and feasible to pen them all in like sheep into a pen into the same currency? And is it actually in their interest? We know it's backfired spectacularly for the people of Greece, but there will be other convulsions as well. And of course, um, my opponent says that nobody has been forced uh, into the Eurozone. What I said to him at dinner is this. We have something the Latvians don't have. We have 46 years of experience of this organization. We joined the European Economic Community on the day I was born, the 24th of January 1972. Go back to 1972 and think what it was like then, and think about the huge changes that have taken place within this organization, from the EEC to the European Community to the EC, now to the EU, a constant methodical move 
towards taking away powers from sovereign national governments and cementing them, secreting them uh, in Brussels. And if you just look at what's happened over the last 46 years, extrapolate to yourselves what will happen during the course of your lifetimes over the next 46 years. If the speed of change within the European Union and then the, if the velocity and the trajectory and the direction is anything like over the next 46 years that it has been over the previous 46 years, we are moving rapidly towards a single supranational state. And they don't like it when you get it wrong. If you take on Brussels, as the people of Denmark did, as the people of France did, and as the people of Ireland did, they had the temerity to vote against EU treaties. Do you know what happens to them? They're told to think again. Have the, have the referendum again. You've got it wrong this time. It doesn't fit in with our plans. We will force you uh, to think again. So no, no, that they are on course to a supranational state and they won't let any, anything or anybody get in it. And one of the reasons that it is so difficult for us at the moment in pulling out of the European Union, and I've got more white hair now, grey hair because of Brexit than, than any <coughs> other, uh, other issue. Think about how complex it is now for us to pull out of the European Union and the huge difficulties that we as a sovereign nation state are going through now in extricating ourselves out of this organisation and think how much more difficult it will be 40 years from now when they have the single flag, the single EU army, the single currency, the single president, the single parliament. It will be impossible. So they've got you hook, line and sinker in this new political entity with less and less transparency, less and less accountability and less power for individual citizens. Thank you. I'd like to take a question from the audience now. So if you do have a question which will be open to both participants to weigh in on, please do raise your hand. Let's go to the uh, woman in the front row here. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. And I would just like to elaborate a little bit on the question of the Euro in Eastern Europe. Having spent a delightful summer traveling around northeastern Poland and Lithuania, one sort of, I quickly discovered by chatting to people on the street that a phenomenon which is increasingly prevalent is Lithuanians coming across the border to Polish towns such as Suwałki and even the tiny Sejny, which is a border town with a population of about 5,900 roughly, because they say that since 2015, when Lithuania joined the Euro, prices of everyday goods have become so unaffordable that it's cheaper for them to drive over the border to Poland and buy their ordinary household products there. Now, what would you both say to this in terms of how profitable it is for countries in East Central Europe to join the single currency? Could, um, could I get your take on that, please? Uh, okay, so on uh, Euro's uh, effect on uh, prices, I would say this is a question, uh, I'll get to Eastern Europe, but this uh, predates uh, uh, Eastern Europe, actually, this is a debate ever since uh, establishment in Euro. Uh, there was uh, mm, uh, lots of uh, perceptions that Euro increased uh, prices uh, and there had been uh, some uh, studies uh, to which extent Euro has in increased uh, prices. Uh, and actually, uh, in the countries which now last had been uh, introducing Euro, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Slovakia, we had been studying a number of uh, uh, cases, um, uh, this uh, one-off effect due to additional costs of changing from national currency to euro, it's a uh, few uh, decimal points of, uh, uh, of a per percentage point of inflation. So it's a uh, relatively minor effect. In Lithuania, after Lithuania uh, joined in 2015, uh, there was actually 0.7 percent uh, 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 negative inflation. Uh, in Latvia, when we joined uh, in 2014, inflation was below 1 percent. 
when you ask uh, people uh, uh, how euro has af affected uh, prices, uh, answer was, yeah, significant increase. Uh, in uh, Estonia, uh, it was also interesting experience. Uh, Estonia joined in 2011. Uh, at that time, Gazprom decided to raise uh, natural gas prices, which then triggered, for example, into higher heating tariffs. So reasons for price increases had n nothing to do with euro, but of course it was euro's fault that uh, heating tariffs had increased, even though it was Gazprom's decision to raise natural gas prices, which increased uh, heating uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, you have price differences also within uh, euro area, and uh, there are reasons, efficiencies of markets, different uh, uh, excise rates, to give some uh, anecdotes, uh, uh, in, within Eurozone, in our corner in Eurozone, uh, Finns come massively uh, to Estonia to buy uh, alcohol and cigarettes. Both Eurozone countries, it just happens that excise rates are lower in Estonia. And since a couple of years, Estonians have come uh, uh, massively to Latvia to buy the same stuff, because at current juncture, excise rates are lower in Latvia than uh, Estonia. You can find that kind of examples of uh, fuel and many, uh, uh, many other uh, uh, areas. So uh, that you have within a single market different uh, prices, this is uh, something which exists inside Eurozone and outside Eurozone. If you would look at uh, different uh, uh, prices on different uh, goods from Germany to Italy to Malta to Finland to Lithuania, you will find uh, different uh, prices. And it's also true with uh, countries outside Eurozone. But if you look at the actual effect and actual inflation after introducing <coughs> the Euro, you do not see any spike of inflation in countries which have introduced the Euro. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and and and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and how, how I um, thank you very much for the question. I, I've actually also I, I take my daughter Alexis uh, every year uh, to the Polish seaside, um, <clears throat> close, not far from the uh, Li Lithuania Lithuanian border, that area, and we see huge numbers. I corroborate your story. We see huge numbers of uh, Lithuanian citizens who are crossing the border just to buy products in Poland because the euro has driven up costs in their own country. But it just isn't just on the Lithuanian-Polish border. It's, it's um, a thing that has been said over and over again in many countries in the European Union where people have stated that prices have increased as a result of the euro. And of course you're absolutely right, I was talking about a lot of highfalutin constitutional and political issues, but what is really important for constituents and for citizens is what impact does it have on their day-to-day -day lives. And I have to say to you, um, the European Union is a protectionist racket and it's designed to protect uh, sometimes inefficient industries within the European Union at the expense of uh, industries and services uh, outside of the European Union. Um, the poorest in our society, in Shrewsbury, the poorest of my constituents, will spend the most on food, clothing and footwear as a percentage of their overall household expenditure. These are the people who are most affected by these sort of increases. Not the elites of Brussels, not the people on hundreds, salaries of hundreds of thousands of pounds and their huge uh, pensions, but the poorest in our society <laughs> see the biggest impact on their day-to-day -day lives as a result of these increases. And I have to say to you, you know, I'm looking forward to, in a post-Brexit world, um, actually starting to work to reduce prices by having free trade deals with third world countries. Uh, we give at the moment in overseas aid 14 billion pounds of your money in foreign aid. That is more than France and Italy combined. I'm very proud of the amount of money that we send in overseas aid and I stand by the fact that we should spend 0.7% on GDP on international aid. 
as a Christian country, we have a duty and responsibility to help some of the poorest and most vulnerable across the world. But look at what the European Union does. Coffee, no, hardly any, coffee, no tariffs for coffee. Why? Because we don't grow coffee in the European Union. Roasted coffee, massive tariffs designed to protect the inefficient coffee roasting industry businesses of Germany and Italy. I would rather buy the roasted coffee directly from Colombia, allow the Colombians to have this value-add processing industry, and actually, rather than just giving aid to third world countries, help them by trading with the United Kingdom. I think in the post-Brexit world, we will thrive as a nation. I believe in this nation. I think foreigners who have come to this country like me, the kindness that we've been shown by the British people, their, the way they interact with us, I have a huge amount of loyalty to this country. I believe in this country. I believe the people in this country will persevere and get over any obstacles that are put in their way. And, and as an independent sovereign nation, we will show what free trade agreements are like rather than the protectionist racket of the European Union. And I promise you one thing, we will not be the only country in your lifetime that pulls out of the European Union. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our debate this evening. So I hope you join me in a final round of applause to both of our speakers.